I'm glad you are here. We're in a, in a series that we started last week, and it's a, it's a series called Refocus, and it really is helping us just kind of get the right perspective again on the things that matter and not get distracted by the patterns of the world. And if you were with us last week, we talked about the camera and how amazing a camera like this is because of all the features that it offers. But sometimes if you're like me, you're like, it's too complicated. There's too many buttons. There's too much to focus on. I'm just going to use my iPhone to take the picture and let the iPhone do it for me. But maybe you're not a photographer and you're like, I, I don't get the aperture and, and the, the shutter speed and the stacking. Maybe you're more into boating. I actually looked up some sailing uh, phrase. I'm not a boater. I don't know what happens. But I know that, listen, I know this, that if the captain doesn't adjust the mast and the sails to the wind, the wind is not going to adjust to the sails. Think about this. We in our culture today expect the Bible to adjust to us. rather than us adjust to the Bible. We expect, if a captain sat in the middle of the ocean and the wind shifted and he didn't adjust his mast and didn't what they call jib the mast, he would sit there like a dead duck. The, the, the wind's not going to change to him. Like, I'm not a sailor, I don't get it. Maybe you're a sports guy, you're a simpleton like me. Think about this. Joe Montana, Steve Young, Tom Brady... But perhaps to me, one of the best people that got to the line of scrimmage and surveyed what the defense was doing and would call an audible was this guy. He could adjust on the fly. He wasn't like, that guy's going to blitz. Let's see if he can get me. No, no, no. That guy's coming and he's going to kill me. Block that guy. He didn't adjust to the defense. He adjusted his team to make sure the defense didn't come at him. And I think sometimes we just think, well, the culture is not going to affect me. Yes, it will. The world is fighting for you. This was the principle last week, right? The principle last week is because there are two forces fighting for you, everything you do is going to feel like conflict. You'll never be free from conflict. There's a fight for you. Good, evil, right, wrong, holy, unholy, righteousness, unrighteousness. It's obedience or disobedience. There is a fight for you. And so what Paul said, and this is what we kind of talked about last week, was I urge you, friends, brothers, sisters, please don't conform to the patterns of the world. The patterns of the world are very simply this. Self-gratification, comfort, easy life, everyone is right. And the patterns shape our thinking. The patterns shape our reasoning. The patterns of the world shape our emotions and our perspectives. And what Paul says is don't be conformed. So how do we do that? The last week, again, the, the principle was this. Be a living sacrifice. Choose every day what you will live for and choose every day what you will die to. Holiness, unholiness. Righteousness, unrighteousness. Obedience, disobedience. You have to choose what you will live for and what you will die to. And so Romans chapter 12 is our text. I'm urging you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. It's your true and proper worship. Don't conform to the pattern of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is good and perfect and pleasing will. How many of you before last week had heard this verse? Anybody? You, some of us knew this. How many of you had this verse memorized? You know this verse top to bottom. It's a good verse to know. But here's what I love about Scripture. All scripture is not in isolation. Until you get to Revelation 22, 21, there's always a next. Scripture is never in isolation, which means there's a next to this. And we talked about this last week that we're going to just kind of bite sized, mica hamburger, swimming pool sized. If you weren't here, you're like, what? I don't get it. Go back and watch it. We're going to just bite size it. And here's what comes next Paul continues to write after Romans 12, 1 and 2, he gets to this. So don't conform to the patterns of the world, but be transformed. For the grace given me, I say to every one of you, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought. But rather, you know, context don't conform, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just if each of you have one, uh, has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we... Though there's many of us, there's all sorts of us, form one body. And each member belongs to the others. 
Paul boy. That means that I, as a body of Christ, belong to you, and you, as a part of the body of Christ, belong to me. He's getting weird. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. Don't conform to the patterns of the world. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it's serving, then serve. If it's teaching, then teach. If it's to encourage, then give encouragement. If it's giving, then just give generously. If it's to lead, do it diligently. And if it's to show mercy, do it cheerfully. There's a principle and a practice in these six verses, just like there was last week. I'm going to give you your principle first. There's a difference between self-aware and self-conscious. There's a difference between being self-aware and being self-conscious. Has anybody been around someone? I call them the me monster. That they just, they love themselves and they think highly of themselves. And in fact, when you're around them, they let you know that you're lucky to be in their presence. Like, I have graced you and you're, you think the same thing I do. I wonder why they think so highly of themselves. They're really not all that great. Uh, listen, pure judgment, I know we're not supposed to do it, but that's what I think. When someone graces me with their presence and lets me know that I'm just lucky to be with them, I'm like, you're really not all that good. But on the flip side, have you ever been around somebody who just, their body language, their lack of self-awareness uh, or self-confidence just screams, I'm a failure, I'm a nobody, I have nothing to offer, I have, I have feelings about them. I'm like, man, I wish they could see themselves the way I see them. I like being around that person. Why don't they have more confidence? In fact, I would rather be around that person than the old uh, egotistical Eddie over there. Right? We, don't, we don't necessarily like that guy. But there's two truths. They're self-aware, and some people aren't. And they're self-conscious, which some people are. Now, I want to illustrate this. I want you to understand how this plays out for everybody. This is arguably one of the nicest ballparks in all of Major League Baseball. It's amazing if you've ever been. They're professionals. They make millions of dollars to play a game, which boggles my mind sometimes, but that's another conversation for another day. The Major Leagues, Triple A, which is the level down, Double A, Single A, College Ball, High School Ball, Kid Pitch, coach pitch, and t-ball. They all play by the same rules. It doesn't matter your age and stage of life. If you hit the ball out this way and you're not self-aware of who you are and you're not, you're not really understanding who God created you to be, you're missing the game that Jesus called you to. If you hit the ball out here, this is called the foul pole. If you hit the ball out of bounds, nothing can happen in the game. No runners can advance. No teams can score. You have to stay within the field of play. And it's the same principle of Christianity. It's the same principle when it comes to your relationship with Jesus. No matter if you think too highly of yourself or you think too lowly of yourself, you're missing who God calls you to be. And it doesn't matter your age if you're a professional Christian or t-ball, you're a brand new Christian. We all play by the same game. The same rules. We all have the same playing field. And it's not going to change to us. We change to it. What Paul says is, don't think too highly of yourself. What he says is, use sober judgment. And he's actually talking about basically what you would, you would understand it today. Don't be drunk. Like, don't be under the influence. Have a correct view. I've got, a, I've got two buddies, they're close friends, and, and, and you can judge me all you want, I don't care. They are heavy drinkers. Like, I'm going to tell you a story about one of my buddies, it's probably 2017 or 18. We were sitting at his garage, they were all drinking, and my buddy was 18 Natty Lights in. That's an alcoholic beverage, 18 of them. And he decided he was going to buy some concert tickets for a concert he wanted to go to. And I'm like, bro, I don't think this is the right time to purchase tickets. I'm just, listen, I'm not trying to be your parent, but probably not the best time. He went ahead and did it. And he woke up the next morning and he texted me. He goes, guess what? I bought tickets in Colorado uh, and, and not in, in Chicago where I thought I could drive. Now I've got to buy airline tickets. And now I've got to buy hotels. 
and now I've got to get a rental car, and now I've got to get food, and his $300 adventure for the tickets cost him $2,000 by the time it was over. And I'm not one to say, I told you so. But I told you so. I warned you, 18 Hattie Lights in, this is probably not the best decision, my friend. See, when we don't have a sober view, a clear view of who we are, we actually have a faulty view, which causes us to miss who Jesus called us to be. Use sober judgment. Don't be under the influence of anything or anyone that will tell you you're something you're not. This is so good from Paul. That the patterns of the world and the directions of the world will tell you, they will make you think you are something you're not. Let me give you some examples. Your waist size and your body shape. If you don't have a size four, you're not beautiful. If you don't have a six pack and you got a dad bod, you can't be good looking. Then if you don't have, uh, if you feel like, if you don't have the, the, the nicest car and the nicest house and go on all these vacations and have all the name brand stuff, you're, you're less than. And, and the world will make us feel self-conscious. Technology. Let me give you one more. The stupid Stanley tumbler mugs. I don't, the only Stanley cup that you should have is the trophy in the NHL. All right? No, I'm just kidding. But here's the thing. I, I joke about it because I see Stanley as the big thing right now, but you know that last year it was Yeti? And the year before that, it was Contigo, and before that, it was Thermos, and before that, it was the Hydro Flask, and before that, it was the RTIC, and before that, it was the Clean Canteen. There will always be something to tell you you're less than if you don't have it. Always. I'm not saying Stanleys are wrong, they're stupid expensive. But if you have to have a Stanley to fit in with that group, that's the wrong group. If, you feel, if, that, if that group makes you feel less than because you don't look like or dress like or talk like or act like them, then that's not the right group. See, sometimes we conform because we want to be like them. And, and Paul is saying, use sober judgment. Have a correct view of yourself. And don't conform to the patterns of the world. See, self-conscious means this. It means to see myself as I think others see me or how I want them to see me. Now, I'm going to make a, a confession, all right? This is a pathetic confession, true story. Before I bought my own home gym workout, equipment when the world shut down in COVID, I was an active member of Planet Fitness. Loved Planet Fitness. And I would go, and when I was working out and there was a group of younger guys that had a better body than I did, you know what I would do when I would leave a, a stack machine? I would pull the pin and I would drop it down and I would put it in. So when I walked away and those guys came, they'd be like, holy smokes. That guy's stronger than he looks. Oh, I'm all guilty. For sure. It's embarrassing. It's pathetic. But I was self-conscious. I wanted them to look at me and view me a certain way. I'll let you gather yourself. Go ahead and laugh. You guys done? You're making me self-conscious. I used to do that. Because, because I wanted, wanted them to see me a certain way. way. No, no one's immune, immune from this. No, no, no one is immune from the self-conscious thoughts. You know why? Because, because companies have departments, departments, entire departments, staff, and they make a lot of money to market you to make you self-conscious. Marketing people get paid buco bucks to make you feel inferior and self insecure and self conscious, so you buy their products so you feel better about themselves. Don't you want to have a body like theirs? Then wear this Lululemon, or as I call it, Lululemon. It's very fancy. That's a very nice Lululemon. They want you to wear that so you look, nah, what? But they're targeting you. 
Don't you, you want to have a marriage, marriage like theirs? Then attend this seminar, read this book, be a part of this group, subscribe to this, and you can have a marriage like theirs. You deserve this. You know, if you were really successful, you would have this by now. And, and the, the patterns, patterns of the world will tell, try to make us feel self-conscious so that we conform to them, so that we fit in with them. How many of you uh, have a cell phone? Anybody have a cell phone? Yeah, yeah all of us. Now, now I'm, gonna, I'm, I don't, I'm not trying to be rude. If you're over 60, you're not going to quite understand this. If you're 40 to 60, you'll resonate it. And if you're zero to, to mid-30s, you are living it. The cell phone has become our identity. And if you're over 60, you're like, no, it hasn't. If you're 20, yes, it has. I've heard people say, I can't live without my cell phone. I would die if I didn't have this. If I didn't have my cell phone, I would miss a lot of meetings because everything is in my calendar, but I wouldn't die because it doesn't define me. But for a teenager, again, if you're over 60, you're like, that's stupid. That's, but that, no, that's their life. They've had a phone in their hands since they were born. It, it owns them and defines them. But the truth is, it doesn't. It doesn't define you. Just for a second, this is called an all skate. Everybody participate. I want everybody just to do this. Just everybody breathe in deep. Now out through your nose, breathe that out for five seconds. And do it again. That's who you are. The breath of God breathed into you to give you life. Not a phone, not a tumbler, not a product, not a weight drop down to look. But that has not, that's not what defines you. The breath of God who breathed his life into you. Listen, if you never said yes to Jesus, you're still created in his image. You're created in the image of God. Whether you said yes to him or not, you are still created by him and for him on purpose. So the breath that you breathe is who you are. That's who you are. And the cell phone has become this image of the person we wish we were. So we can post things and publish things. And you know what sometimes we do? We compare ourselves to others who are putting forward a false reality. So we're comparing ourselves to a non-truth. Because they're posting and publishing what they wish they were. Because they're self-conscious or insecure. And so until you have your identity found in Jesus, and Jesus alone, you will always, in the baseball picture, be out of bounds. Don't, Don't rely on others to define you. Let God define you. So self-aware, self-conscious, there's a battle, there's a struggle. And here's what I think, and again, I'll just say this. Self-awareness is to see yourself accurately and to see you as God created you. But this part is so hard. If you don't have someone in your life that can help you assess your blind spots, you're going to miss them. My prayer, prayer partner for 20, 22 years now has, has every right to say, Dan, I see something off here. I'm hearing something off. He has that place in my life. Because if I can't see myself accurately, I'm over here. I'm outside of the boundaries and, I, and I'm missing the playing field. So you see yourself accurately and you see yourself how God sees you. Self-awareness. Being, being transformed, transformed into, into the image of God. God. But here's, here's what, what happens for all of Nobody is immune from this either. Every single one of us starts off with, with innocence. innocence. Remember when you had kids or you were a kid and you would go to the store, you'd go to Walmart or you'd go to the store and you'd wear your, your uh, Superman cape? Or your kids would wear Cinderella dress or Bella, Frozen princess and the Crocs and they would walk through the store like a princess and nobody cared. It was cute. Innocent. We all started there. And somewhere between zero and kindergarten, first grade, second grade, every single one of us came face to face with self consciousness. It was in second grade, maybe third, 
up until middle school, early high school, where we realized, holy smokes, I get treated differently by how I look. I get treated differently by the grades I get. I get treated differently by who I sit with at the cafeteria table. I get treated differently by what my parents drive. And somewhere between second and third grade, in middle school and early high school, we struggle and become insecure and self-conscious. We never cared what people thought of us. We wear our Spider-Man outfit in April. You're loud at Halloween, that's normal. But April, it's kind of weird. I don't care. I'm four years old. I can wear what I want to wear. And somewhere it shifts, and we all become a little bit self-conscious. And during this phase of life, and nobody was immune from it, some of us cared more about what others thought of us than what God thought of us. And we cared more about what, what others said about us than what God said about us. And we deceived ourselves and became something that we weren't intended or created to be. Self-deception. We begin to believe things that just aren't true, and it directs our future, and it directs our, our thoughts, and, and it directs our behaviors. We believe, we believe things about our body image because you know what magazines and social media and television and movies and advertisements they've told us you have to look a certain way to be loved a certain way. We believe things about our worth and our significance. And the patterns, listen, the patterns of the world have sucked our innocence out of us at younger and younger and younger, and younger ages. The other day, my, my now nine-year-old son, Harrison, had his socks up to his, his knees, because that's the trend with some kids. He's running around the ball fields, and one kid made a comment, why are your socks so high? And I watched Harrison put them right down. I said, Harrison, why are your socks down? He's like, that. And somebody made fun of me. I said, who let me at him? I don't care if he's eight. It's fisticuffs. And I said, Harrison, do you like your socks up or down? He's like, well, I like them up. I said, then, then wear them up. Harrison, who cares what that kid thinks? What do you like? Do you like your socks up? I like them up. I think they look cool. But three minutes later, Harrison goes by with his socks up. I'm like, yes, thank you. Listen, the world will tell you at age nine how to act. And I'll just say this to parents. We're either fostering this self-awareness or we're fostering self-consciousness with our kids. Because I could have said, Harrison, that kid is right. They look stupid. And I would have crushed them. But I choose, chose to say, you know what? I like them up too, buddy. If that's how you like them, wear them like that. You want to wear your hat sideways? Wear your, I don't care how you wear your hat. You'll eventually figure out how it's most comfortable on your head. You want to wear it backwards? Wear it backwards. Frontwards, frontwards, sideways. It doesn't matter to me. How do you want to wear it? We're creating, we foster this as parents, self-awareness or self-consciousness. Got to move forward. So the principle, self-consciousness self or self-aware. I want us all be self-aware, right? But how? Here's the practice. Oh, hang on. I forgot one slide. This is how we're to see it. This is probably an important slide to hit too, by the way. Goodness gracious, Lord help me. See yourself as God sees you. Do you know you're worthy of his love? Ah, oh, but Dan, you don't know what I did last night. No, I don't. I still know you're worthy of his love. But Dan, you don't know what I did this past week. Yeah, but you're still worthy of his acceptance. You don't know what happened to me. Yeah, but you're still worthy of meaning, significance, and belonging. You're worthy of his one and his only son to come and give his life for you. That's what your worth is. If we could wrap our heads around this, that the worth you carry because of his love for you with his son, it would change how you see yourselves. But don't be conformed to the patterns of the world. So the principle is self-awareness and self-consciousness. So how do we become more self-aware? How do we realize what Paul is saying here? Here's your practice. With intentionality, be willing to give yourself to something bigger than yourself. 
The reason that some of these words are big, bold, capitalized, underlined is this doesn't happen accidentally. You don't accidentally give yourself to something bigger than yourself because the patterns of the world is to serve self and save self and please self, self-gratification, easy, self-protect, save the best for me, get served, get more, get better, get, 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 take, take, take. So with intentionality, if you want to become self-aware of who God created you to be, with intentionality, be willing to give yourself to something bigger than yourself. Jesus didn't come to be served. What did Jesus come to do? To serve. Jesus didn't come to get. What did he do? He came to give. Himself as a ransom for many. He came to give his life away. And when we can shift our perspective and refocus, whether it's the camera or the sale or the line of scrimmage analogy, when we can shift our perspective to this, we learn to give ourselves away to something bigger than ourselves. In fact, it's one of the reasons why here at our church, at Centerline Church, we invite people to serve. Different times of the year, we invite people or ask people, hey, why don't you step up to serve? It's not, I'm gonna, this is going to sound weird, it's not because I need it from you. It's because I want it for you. Because the patterns of the world were consumers. Every single one of us is a consumer. And the patterns of the world says, just come in on a Sunday morning, sit down, laugh at your pastor because he changes his weights and he's an idiot, and then leave and don't get plugged in. It's the pattern of the world. That's why we invite people to serve, whether it's children's ministry, student ministry, worship ministry, Tech ministry, ushers, greeters. It's not because it's not I need you to do that. It's because I want you to give yourself away to something bigger than yourselves and realize you're a part of something bigger than yourself. And that's why Paul wrote the body in these six verses, the body. There's many parts, different functions. And every time Paul refers to the church, listen, he refers to it as the body. But you know what he you know what we do and we're really good at it we compare body parts oh my god but they're they're a better speaker than i am i, I can't do that they're better they're they're better uh, a musician I, I can't do that they're a better singer i i can't do that they hold the door and smile way better than i could hold the door and smile i i, I can't do that they're better with kids they can lead a small group and here's what happens instead of stepping up we step out because we can't be the body part that we want to be. Let me say that again so we catch it. Oftentimes, in our insecurities, we look at them and go, I wish I could do that, and because I can't be that, I'm not going to help at all. And Paul says, every single one of us belongs to each other. You have a gift to bring to, and I'm going to talk personally, to Centerline Church. You have a gift to bring here. To the body of Christ, the church is not pragmatic, it's sacred. Pragmatic means convenient. I'll go when it's convenient. I'll serve when it's convenient. I'll give when it's convenient. But the body of Christ is not about convenience and pragmatism. It's about sacredness. The body of Christ is sacred. And one of the knocks against churches, and even this church, I've heard it before, um, is the churches need more programs. We need more programs. We need more groups and small groups and Sunday schools and hymns and meals for the community. And the church people expect the church to do the work, and they get the perk of having their name attached to that, to that church, but they're not willing to, as Jesus said, lift a finger to help. I'm not trying to come harsh. I'm trying to help us understand. The church is not pragmatic. It's not a convenience thing. The church is sacred, and we're all a part of the body at the church. Let's all just say it this way. We don't need more programs in the church. We need more people to be the church. Like what's, what's the harm, or what's stopping you from saying, you know what, I've got about 15 people in my network I'm going to invite them to my house. I'm going to have a group with them, a small group. You can call it a Bible study. You can call it a small group. You can have a dinner. I'm just going to invite them over, and I'm just going to do life with them. 
That's the church. I, and I, 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 I'll just say this, as your pastor, I don't even need you to be affiliated with the church if you want to do that. If you want to start a group in your home of people who don't know Jesus or do know Jesus and you want to encourage and build each other up, start it. We don't need more programs in the church. We need more people to be the church. Sometimes, you know what we do? We interact with the church instead of engage with it. We just interact with it instead of engage with it. Now, I will say this. I want to pause, and, and some people might feel like, man, he's, he's, he's harsh today. Goodness gracious. I didn't get his Cheerios this morning, which I didn't. I didn't have Cheerios this morning. But I will just say this. For many of you, one of the things I love about our church is you come in faithfully week in and week out, and you submit yourselves to the teaching, not of Dan, but of the Word of God. And you know what the world says? That's dumb. You're your own authority. You don't need this. And I will say as your pastor, I love the faithfulness of so many of us in this room who come in week in and week out. Because the patterns of the world will tell you, you're your own authority. Don't, don't worry about this. You can skip. You can miss. You're your own ethics and you're your own morals and you create your own boundaries and you create your own, your own truth. You just be you, whoever you want to be. And yet there is a clear center line to follow. And for many of us, we come week in, week out, we say, I am submitting myself to the holy word of God. Am I going to be perfect? No, I'm going to fall short of the glory of God, but I'm going to keep striving and I'm going to stay within left field and right field. I'm going to stay within the boundaries that God that God created for us. See, when you say yes to this, you know what you're doing is you're modeling to your family or you're modeling to your community or you're modeling to your coworkers the sacredness rather than the pragmatic church. Let me give you a quick example of this and, and then we'll wrap up. Many of you know I grew up in a, in a pastor's house. My dad was a pastor. His dad was a pastor. And as, as a middle schooler and high schooler, one of the things I hated about my house was every Wednesday night from September through June, every Wednesday night we had Bible study in our living room. And I hated it. Because it meant on a Wednesday when I came home from school, I had to vacuum. I had to clean the half bath. My brother and I had to dust. And we had to tidy up every Wednesday. And as I got into middle school and high school and began to play high school hockey and all that stuff, you know what I had to do? I had to walk to the rink, which was a mile away. Up hills both ways. It wasn't up hills both ways, but it felt like it. But we had to walk. Can you not drive us? No, we have Bible study tonight. Really? Those people take priority over your own flesh and blood. Okay, I was, I was adopted, so it wasn't flesh and blood, so I couldn't quite say that, but I mean, they take over us. I'll tell you, I got, I got angry some nights. It's minus 30 in February in Canada. And I gotta walk a mile and then skate for two hours and then walk a mile back. This is the, the church should not win in this. I should. But what my parents modeled and what they taught me was the church is not pragmatic and convenient. The church is sacred. So if you want to keep playing hockey on a Wednesday night, you're gonna have to prioritize that and you go on your own. We're not missing our small group Bible study. And at the time, I hated it, and now I look back and go, thank you, Mom and Dad. Thank you for showing me and modeling to me what, what convictions you had. There's nothing wrong with taking vacations. There's nothing wrong with missing a Sunday. There's nothing wrong with having a Sabbath. But listen, in a world where the pattern is easy and convenient and self-serve and self-gratification, there's nothing wrong with saying, Jesus, you get my first. You get my first energy. You get my first attention. You get my first thoughts. You get my first fruits. You get my tithe. You get my first attendance of the week. You, got, you get first. It's such a balance as a pastor to say, God gets first, but you can have a vacation. Because you can. You can have a vacation. But the church isn't pragmatic. It's sacred. Maybe, you, maybe for you it's just a shift of your mind. I'm not here to have the church serve me. I'm here to serve the church. I'm not here to have the church serve me. I'm here to serve the church, the body. If it's teaching, teach. 
If it's prophesying, prophesy. If it's giving, give. If it's showing mercy, then show mercy diligently. If it's to lead, then lead well. Paul wrote it for us. That you're, not, you're not here to have the church serve your, you. You're here to have uh, yourself serve the church. So here, here we're going to close. The patterns of the world will tell you what you want to hear. But the word of God will tell you what you need to hear. The patterns of the world will tell you how you should feel. The Word of God will tell you what is true no matter how you feel. Oh, these are, these are, if we can catch this church, your life will change. The patterns of the world will say, just be transactional. Go when it's convenient. Serve when it's convenient. Meet your neighbor's needs when it's convenient. The Word of God will say, no, 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 be engaged, be participating, serve other people. The patterns of the world will tell you how other people perceive you. Oh. But the Word of God will tell you how He sees you. Some of us need to wrestle this down. Patterns of the world will say, I don't know, you don't have a Stanley. God says, the only Stanley that matters is the big cup the NHL players hold. The patterns of the world will tell you their truth. This will tell you God's truth. And there's a difference. Don't be conformed to the patterns of the world, but be transformed from the inside out. So, here's how we're going to close. It's, it's an all skate. skate. It's, it's everybody. everybody. All right? Everybody's, Everybody's invited to this. this. I'm, I'm going to encourage you every day this week to read Romans 12. Romans 12. Not, not two verses. I'm talking all 21 of them. And I timed it. I sat down this week and I pressed start on my timer. And I read it fast and it took me about 90 seconds. And I read it slow and it took me just over two minutes. It's, it's not a big chapter and it's not a hard read. So I'm going to invite you to do that. Every day this week, I'm going to read, and I would love for you to join me, I'm going to read Romans chapter 12 every day this week. And I'll probably read it in different translations each day to get a different take, a different view. And I want to invite you into that. I don't have time. Yes, you do. You have two minutes. Guarantee it. Probably shouldn't say this, but I'm going to say it. Kim will say, don't say it. You probably shouldn't. You have two minutes on the toilet. You're on your phone anyway. Just call it as it is. You have two minutes. Man, you have 40. Okay, like there's a... All right? Just say it as it is. Uh, stick to your notes. Okay, I gotta... Whew, Kim's gonna kill me. Okay. It will take you 90 seconds to two minutes to read Romans chapter 12. And I'm just telling you as your friend, and I'm telling you as your pastor, it is life-changing and it's life-giving. 